es funktioniert und in diesem Sinn beginnen wir mit dieser kleinen Verzögerung. Äh, schönen guten Tag, meine Damen und Herren. Ich wäre äh, Maxim Kantor am Anfang äh, ganz kurz äh, auf Deutsch vorstellen und das Gespräch führen wir dann auf Englisch. Ähm, wir werden uns auch nicht ganz genau an diesen äh, Titel New and Old Demons, Resinking Power and Evil äh, Halten, denn das heißt so gut wie alles und nichts. Maxim Kantor ist ein Schriftsteller, Maxim Kantor ist ein Maler, Maxim Kantor ist ein Intellektueller. Er ist Russe mit einem deutschen Pass, er ist Jude mit einem argentinischen Pass, er lebt in Oxford und auf einer Kanalinsel und in Berlin. Kurz gesagt, Maxim Kantor ist eine nicht ganz leicht zu fassende Person. Zuerst ist Kantor eigentlich der in Moskau in einer prominenten intellektuellen Familie geboren wurde als Maler aufgetreten und international wohl schlagartig bekannt geworden durch seine Teilnahme an der Biennale in Venedig Mitte der 90er Jahre, 96 oder 97, glaube ich. Ähm, Maxim Kantor hat immer geschrieben. Äh, ich habe ähm, Mitte der 90er Jahre einmal einen sehr merkwürdigen Band mit Erzählungen in Moskau gekauft, sehr schön ähm, aufgemacht, in Deutschland gedruckt, russische Erzählungen und äh, niemand wusste so recht, wer dieser Maxim Kantor äh, denn ist, äh, dieser äh, junge, unbekannte Autor. Niemand, das heißt äh, natürlich nicht, äh, dass man diesen Namen Kantor in Moskau nicht äh, gekannt hätte. Äh, sein Vater war ein äh, relativ prominenter Philosoph, der sich in diesem eigentümlichen Zwischenbereich bewegt hat, der die russische Intelligenz, wenn man ihren unter Anführungszeichen guten Teil als den tatsächlichen Intelligenz Teil ansieht, die in einem relativ prekären Zustand zwischen offiziell und inoffiziell bewegt haben. In diesem Umfeld äh, gab es auch noch den Bruder äh, von Maxim Kantor, also viele Kantors in Moskau. Ähm, in dieser ähm, Welt äh, von ähm, offiziell und halb dissident äh, denkenden Menschen ähm, ist Maxim Kantor aufgewachsen. Ähm, aufgewachsen heißt, äh, dass sich in diesem Umfeld ähm, relativ ähm, prominente Namen finden. Ich nenne nur einen dieser, auch im Westen, zumindest in den 80er Jahren sehr, sehr prominenten Namen. Das war der Philosoph Alexander Sinoviev, der Philosoph und Schriftsteller Sinoviev, der in dieser Emigrationswelle der 70er Jahre in den Westen kam und im Westen hat man diese Leute ja immer mit großem Vergnügen aufgenommen und äh, man würde das Neudeutsch äh, so nennen, instrumentalisiert. Ähm, ich spreche von dem schwierigen äh, Problem, äh, wie man ähm, antisowjetisch sich bewegen, arbeiten und denken konnte, äh, ohne dabei äh, sowjetisch zu sein. Es gibt einen kleinen Aufsatz des ähm, 91, 90 verstorbenen georgischen Philosophen Merab Mamartashvili, der einmal vom Gesetz des Dissidenten Nichtdenkens gesprochen hat. Das heißt, das sind lauter schwierige Felder, in denen wir uns da bewegen. Maxim Kantor ist dann schlagartig in den 2000er Jahren, als er schon längst im Ausland gelebt hat und sich seine eigene Karriere gebaut hat, mit einem Buch Utschepnik ähm, Reservanie mit einer sehr ähm, äh, polemischen, wuchtigen, ähm, äh, erzählerischen Darstellung dieser offiziellen, gegenwärtigen russischen Kunstszene äh, wieder auf den Plan getreten. 
äh, und hat sich ähm, in die Mitte dieses äh, russischen Literaturgeschehens äh, hineinbegeben, um relativ schnell, wenn ich das äh, richtig äh, sehe, äh, daraus wieder zu verschwinden. Äh, es ist von Kantor äh, ein Buch äh, auf Deutsch erschienen, nämlich voriges Jahr, Rotes Licht, das eine mehr oder weniger Familiengeschichte der, der Familie Cantor ist, die sich in einem großen Kreis vollzieht. Das Buch beginnt mit dem Tod des mehr oder weniger autobiografischen Vaters, des Erzählers, eines gewissen Solomon Richters. Die Geschichte der Kantorfamilie in ganz wenigen Worten gesagt ist eine Familie, die zu Beginn des 20. Jahrhunderts ganz am Anfang aus Bessarabien jüdisch sich in den Westen bewegt, eine Emigration vollzieht. In den 20er, späten 20er Jahren kehrt diese Familie in die Sowjetunion zurück, nämlich der Großvater, der reale Großvater von Maxim Kantor auf, als Geologe eine relativ wichtige, ein relativ wichtiger Beruf in einem Land, das damals gerade, im, wie das so schön hieß, im Aufbau sich befand. Da gibt es Kommunisten und apolitische und diese Geschichte rollt ganz breit durch das 20. Jahrhundert, logischerweise durch den äh, Zweiten Weltkrieg und sie endet mit dem äh, Tod äh, dieses Solomon äh, Richter äh, bezeichnenderweise im Jahr 2014, als in der Ostukraine gerade dieser äh, Krieg tobt, äh, der bis heute kein Ende gefunden hat, der sich zwar sehr verändert hat, ein Krieg, an dem auch in dieser Geschichte kein Zweifel gelassen wird, der von Moskau aus initiiert wird, um, gelinde gesagt, der Ukraine am Zeug zu flicken, um den schon unmittelbar vorangegangenen aggressiven Akt, nämlich die Okkupation der Krim, zu verdecken. Dieses einerseits essayistische Schreiben wird durch diese Familiengeschichte in eine, nennen wir es so, in eine Saga verwandelt. Ich möchte mit einer ein wenig ungewöhnlichen Frage an Maxim Kantor beginnen, die ein, ein Thema, das heute in Russland unter kritischen Intellektuellen immer wieder diskutiert wird, äh, mit einer Frage über die sogenannte Lustration, äh, äh, Perlustration äh, beginnen. Das heißt, warum äh, in der, im unabhängigen Russland, äh, wie Sie wissen, ab äh, 1991, warum keine Lustration stattgefunden hat, äh, denn ähm, damit ist ein Thema, das im Titel angesprochen ist, äh, auch berührt, äh, nämlich äh, die Dämonen äh, dieser sowjetischen, russischen Vergangenheit. You more or less understand what I said. So, uh, the, the first question is, um, this um, matter of, of lustration, uh, intellectuals discuss it quite often in a more or less aggressive way, uh, in a desperate way. Why didn't this happen right after the fall of the Soviet Union, when you could, Russians could come on good terms with who was communist, who will participate in power in the uh, future, who will build the new Russia. Uh, it's somehow connected with all the demons uh, nowadays uh, had their revival. Mm -hmm. Dear Erich, firstly, let me express my gratitude for this very kind introduction and gratitude to everybody here in this little hall for 
hearing us for participation in this um, dialogue. And uh, due to your question, you mean period after the fall of Soviet Union, after the, the, the well, so-called perestroika had happened. You mean why different parties were involved in the process of so-called building of new society? Why this illustration did not happen immediately and only now it starts to be... Uh, discussed. Uh, yes. It's somehow bizarre because uh, one could have discussed or it was somehow discussed in the early 1990s. Yes, right. And it came back uh, two or three years ago. It's a very interesting question and uh, forgive me in advance if my answer brings us a bit deeper to history and I do not want to answer immediately about 90s, but I wish to talk a bit uh, about the nature of Soviet power and resistance to it. Uh, it's very curious, but I think it's rather important to realize that uh, nature of Soviet power itself and of Soviet empire itself was very contradictive. And it was not just as simple as now we receive it as a tyranny. Because it combined in itself the very colonial and imperialistic way of power, since it's really colonized uh, national minorities and other countries and so-called Soviet bloc of uh, East European states and Asia, etc., etc. And in many aspects, it was very usual empire, and it received anti-colonial resistance from national minorities and from those intellectuals who understood that imperialistic power has nothing to do with democratic process of anti-colonization all over the world. So we, we do know all uh, uh, resistance in Baltic countries, in Asian countries, in Muslim environment, etc., etc. This is the first side of the one side of medal of coin. Another side of coin that it was, in many aspects, anti capitalistic states and it used socialistic rhetoric. Even if this rhetoric and all those lozongs were used falsely, were somehow betrayed by its meaning. Even if so-called Soviet Marxism had nothing to do with Marxism in general, but anyway, they did use those rhetoric and it was socialist opponent to capitalistic Western countries. And this combination of being at the same time empire with all features of imperialism and very strange, very ugly, very Khazarian, but at the same time very socialistic country, which made everybody equal even if its equality was on the level of slavery. But it, but it, it was socialist rhetoric. It brought out another type of resistance. So one uh, uh, wave or one stream of resistance was against imperialistic features of Soviet country and another stream of resistance was against its socialistic stream. And one type of dissidents voted for changes in capitalistic way. They wanted to bring market, they wanted to bring uh, certain institutions which would change the economical face of a uh, uh, country, which are uh, going to erase socialism and socialistic ideals at all. As we know from Chubais and Gaidar rhetoric that the first question was to erase socialism and traces of socialism. That was the one uh, 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 stage of resistance. Another one was against imperialism 
and against those features of imperialism which were very, very powerful in the Soviet Empire. So I'm not sure that those two types of resistance did correlate with each other in a proper way. And sometimes when we are speaking about dissidents, we simply do not define clearly which type of dissident movement we are discussing. It is like, I give you a very uh, simple example. While we are discussing the first avant-garde from 100 years ago, we are using avant-garde although we are using simply the word which means for us something. Call for future, uh, change of uh, imperialistic uh, face of the world of that time, etc., etc. But we should not forget that there were those like Tatlin who vote for uh, constructivism, communism, etc., or like Mayakovsky, and those who, like Hlebnikov, voted for national state and returning to, to the past of Russia. The, the, there were a lot of different uh, um, streams and different vectors of movement and variety of avant-garde is something that really sometimes we forget replacing it with just with one single word avant-garde. The same with dissident movement in uh, Russia of 80s and 70s. There were those who vote for capitalistic changes and market, those who vote for anti-colonial uh, change of the big state, those who vote for a religion freedom, a, a absolutely different approach. The, the same ones who vote for religious freedom, they were very, very Russian nationalists. I, I give you a sim simple example of Solzhenitsyn and Glazunov, who, who wear the mask of dissidents as well. Although in nowadays, hardly you can receive Glazunov as a dissident. And uh, those three, probably four, I can continue to count, we, we call all this bunch and all this variety of different stream, we call them dissidents. And of course, being oppressed by power, they were united by this oppression. But within this organismus of dissident, they were very, very different. And in the first appearance of perestroika and changes of um, Soviet Union and Soviet society, they all had, I would not say equal possibilities, but close to that. And we, at that time I still lived in the Soviet Union, we simply did not define ourselves who belongs to which party. It was to our huge surprise that someone who was against Soviet Union became supporter of idea of new Russian empire. But it appeared. And we can say that somebody like Dugin, for instance, who was certainly against Soviet power, and one could expect from him that he is for freedom, he became one of those who strongly supports the uh, uh, new face of Russian imperialism and the new face of uh, a Russian empire, which is uh, uh, which has nothing to do with ideas of democracy and freedom. I, I, I'm sorry the answer is a bit more complicated than probably you expect, but if we do not understand the complexity of event, we're never able to use the word dissident in, in a um, correct meaning. Well, well to, to, uh, to put it clearly, um, on one example, as you mentioned, this early avant-garde, uh, mm -hmm. a very beloved thing in the West, as you know, from the early, um, well, from, finally, from, um, um, from Khrushchev's time, when the new left in the 1960s um, um, suddenly realized, oh, there was a Russian avant-garde, which was a good one. You are very harsh with this avant-garde. We didn't uh, prepare this, but uh, incidentally, I make one quotation from this book. Uh, 
Man könnte sagen, das schwarze Quadrat stellt die Sonnenfinsternis dar. Die Bolschewiki deuteten es als Sieg über die Sonne, während das Hakenkreuz den Sonnenaufgang symbolisiert, die Erneuerung des ewigen Wegs. Wiederbelebung der Hoffnung, Grund zur Hoffnung gab es nicht. Well, to put it in one uh, context, the black uh, quadrat of, of, uh, of, 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 of Malevich and the swastika, I remember um, to give a more concrete uh, uh, example. In the late 1990s, in this house, which organized, uh, organized this festival, the Historical Museum of Vienna, there was an exhibition of Rochenko photos. I know you don't like Roch uh, Rochenko very much. The funny thing was, uh, there were these photos uh, of, uh, when um, uh, Rochenko made um, um, a series about the building of the Volga, of the Moskva Volga channel, yeah? Of course. Obviously, this he was... He served to Soviet power and uh, to Stalinist power. Rochenko was an, one of the trusty servants to all this, and he made uh, reports and photo reports about Belamor Canal and prisoners and so on. <laughs> I, when you say, I do not like uh, Rochenko, sorry to, to well... To, to interrupt you, but uh, Rochenko is not a baby, is not a child, is not a girl that uh, I should uh, uh, like him. I have nothing uh, for him and against him. I do not appreciate his art as I do not appreciate any fascist art uh, at all. Although as a historian of art, and it's one of my uh, occupations, um, uh, as a historian of uh, art, I do know that such type of art exists and uh, I, I, I have to appreciate fact of, of its existence. But anyway, it, 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 it is not my favorite type of art. What I wanted uh, to Avant-garde has many faces. Uh, uh, Rochenko and Malevich certainly are uh, representatives of Russian avant-garde. They were for Khazaran future, for the building of very, uh, um, well, definite and very Mm, aggressive uh, regime, and uh, I do not see much difference with uh, their art and the art of Mussolini and, and Hitler of the, 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 those times. But at the same time, Russian avant-garde is uh, art of Goncharova, Larionov, Chagall, etc., who also are representatives of Russian avant-garde. Russian avant-garde, as Russian dissident movement, is a very complicated uh, event. One uh, should not combine it all in, uh, in one piece. It's, it's all different. It's a bunch of different flowers. So there is a good avant-garde and, the, and the bad one? Uh, there is uh, different. Uh, there are different types of art and we are not able to divide it. There is Baroque art and uh, Rococo art and uh, Romantic art and whatever. We can use the word art for all of it, but probably sometimes we have to define. Don't you think it's a very typical uh, moment uh, to just talk about aesthetics and not about politics? What you try to do when you uh, compare uh, Malevich and the uh, swastika? Aesthetics embody politics. It's very difficult and I think it's wrong to separate two disciplines because all are united in one aegis. So you yes. are a good Marxist? I'm good Platonist. What does that mean? It means that, like Plato, I do believe, following him and following Thomas Aquinas, I do believe that there is a kind of center, Plato called it aegis, uh, which produces ideas and being produced from the one single center, they correspond to each other. I think it's uh, rather usual and very familiar to many uh, philosophical concepts idea and uh, I do not say anything original if I say that aesthetics and politics do correspond with each other. I think it's quite obvious. Um, the thing you mentioned before, a uh, small intervention about uh, um, the Russian avant-garde, you are um, in this book, in many articles, reading your Facebook, 
you are very, very critical with uh, these uh, reformers of the uh, 1990s, uh, mm -hmm. of the reinvention of whatever you call it, uh, the Russian capitalism. Uh, I, I do not think it has something to do with capitalism. I think it was um, a rebirth or revitalization of classical Russian serfdom. And uh, it brought society back. Well, look, what we had in Soviet Union, one could call Kazarian socialism, which was ugly and it was even worse than simply to say Kazarian uh, socialism. It, it was a really kind of aggressive prison with Kazarian socialism as a rule inside of society. And nomenclature was certainly above. And uh, nomenclature lived with other rules and was above this Kazarian socialism. We, it's understandable and it is described by, by many authors. I should not uh, pronounce anything in this aspect because everybody knows it and one can, can read hundreds of thousands of volumes about the structure of this society. When changes appear and it was obvious that one has to destroy this awful construction, in my humble opinion, it would have been good to destroy Kazarian and to leave socialism. What they did, they destroyed socialism and left Kazarian, which probably was a witty decision, but I do not like this decision. Uh, the uh, idea to bring capitalism and to keep Kazarian as, as, a, as a ruling point for this new building of capitalism, uh, brought society back to feudal times and even back to serfdom. What, what, what was very important and curious that nomenclatura, who stood above this Kazarian socialism, appeared and transformed from Soviet nomenclatura to the class of owners to the class of feudals. Uh, this class nomenclature remained unchanged, but it became legalized as owners of society, as a new type of feudals, which is quite an uh, interesting process for historian, but uh, I think it has nothing to do with classical appearance of capitalism. Uh, if you wish to go to Weber or to Zombart or to any poet of capitalism, I'm, I'm, I'm not a great fan of uh, Zombert and, uh, um, uh, and of capitalism in principle, but, or, or Schumpeter in principle, but what had happened in, 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 uh, in Soviet Union and in nowadays Russia has nothing to do with capitalism. It was returning to classical serfdom in which nomenclature became the new class of feudals, and it was done uh, by so-called reforms, which, which I do not consider as reforms. I'm sorry to say it very clearly. Now we have all traces, all obvious traces of what had happened and new aggressive empire which appears now, new feudal empire which appears now, was carefully built in the 90s. And when we, everybody now, are astonished and amazed what had happened. Well, it was well prepared. It was what did the, in that what way. What do you mean by it was well prepared? Because this kind of Russian capitalism did not work uh, uh, very well. No, because... They reinvented, or it was at the very origin, the idea. Uh, there are the stories about Yeltsin even could have uh, occupied, uh, but he didn't want to, uh, could have occupied uh, Crimea. Uh, it happened later on. What do you mean it was prepared at the very beginning? When I say it was... And why does it work? Why does this imperialistic idea work, obviously? Why it works? It works for the very simple reason, because this idea is very vivid in Russia, because Russia is not a country, it's just a huge continent. It's, uh, one has to, to realize it very clearly, it's a huge continent, as huge as Africa. And uh, it, since all its history, it is combined 
from inside with very special imperialistic links. It's the, the worst nightmare of any ruler of Russia to get this country fallen in pieces. Country has to be united to, to survive. Otherwise, Moscow will not do anything without Siberia and East and etc., etc., etc. It's all linked together, and this huge organism exists as empire. In little short periods, when for some reasons empire had to sacrifice little territories, only little, uh, it started and immediately succeeded to get those territories back. As empire, it exists. As a single little country, it will not. And uh, what had happened, let me repeat it again. Instead of Khazar and socialist, they returned to idea of empire, which was prepared. You say, why it was prepared? It was prepared because they did divide country in fjords in several fjords, and it was divided in purpose. You know that all this um, capitalization or privatization was absolutely uh, artificial process. It was artificial process. I, I did not expect we go to this political uh, discussion, but okay, let me finish this uh, discourse anyway. Uh, speaking about privatization, we should not forget that constitution, Soviet constitution, whether it's bad or good or whatever, again, I, I am against Soviet power, I am anti-communist, I was against Soviet power when it was not in fashion, and, and, and so on and so on. Uh, uh, most of my relatives were arrested and I have genetic hate to Soviet power. But anyway, Soviet constitution uh, was written in a way that all property, all resources, all land and resources of the land are in property of people, not of state, but of people. Why it was written this way? For very simple reason, because it was communist constitution, communist, not socialist constitution, but communist constitution, written by communist party. And communism, as you well know, communism denies existence of state in, in, in development. So the, the target of communism is to make a society which lives without state. It is common with anarchism, although anarchism was killed by communism in, in, in Russian history. Anyway, this Soviet constitution underlines in each paragraph that resources are property of people. The trick which was done during privatization was that people and state are the same. And therefore, state should and could make auction out of resources and property. People property was proclaimed as state property. At that time, most of people, let me say 99.9%, did not understand and whoever opened this bloody constitution, and even if one opened it, who did understand it. But when it was done, and when the new class of owners appeared, it was <laughs> absolutely against any possible law which existed to that time. From whom this new class of owners was uh, 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 constructed, was recruited? From, from the former nomenclatura. Who was Gaidar? He was editor-in-chief of magazine Communist, as you well know. And if we are now surprised that leader of new free Russia was Konal of KGB, after all publications of Solzhenitsyn and so on and so on, they elected Konal of KGB to rule country. Isn't it surprising? But why did not we, we were surprised that father of reforms, of capitalistic reforms, is editor-in-chief of magazine Communist? Isn't it also surprising? So when you, when, when you say uh, uh, how it was prepared, it was carefully prepared. And who should be astonished if we got fruits from this tree today? Uh, this tree even was not planted. It was simply carefully washed. And it was planted centuries ago. 
but sometimes even these what uh, people call oligarchs do some good for example all nearly all books of russian liter literature nowadays the translation uh, of them is uh, is paid by the broker of fund not yours but i paid my translation myself so i do not uh, know anything about Prokhorov and I did not get uh, through all my life, I didn't get a penny from oligarchs. Uh, probably it's a kind of poor reason which I uh, inherited from my parents, but I decided once that I will not participate in this game and I did not. It's a minor point uh, why I mentioned it, it's not a very serious thing, but uh, when you read uh, now the new Turgenev or the new Tolstoy, any of them is paid by the Prokhorov Foundation. So they do something good. I am sorry for Tolstoy and Turgenev. <laughs> I see. <clears throat> um, one uh, last question at, the, at this moment. <clears throat> um, as you are an artist, there will be uh, the opening of an uh, exhibition in the Theater Museum uh, the 3rd of October. The 3rd of October. It is uh, opening, uh, uh, exactly, it is an opening which happens, happens in Theater Museum, but it is an uh, exhibition of Academy der Kunst of Vienna and director of Academy, Gallery of Academy der Kunst of Vienna, Dr. Julia Neihaus is sitting in this hall. Uh, Due to her, who kindly organizes this show, the show Bosch and Cantor will be opened in Academy der Kunst, which is in guest by Theater Museum since because the building. Because of the restoration of the, the main restoration building. The uh, restoration uh, uh, I didn't want to make so much propaganda for this exhibition. I just wanted to ask you. Why you not as to make an, propaganda? Uh, yeah, sure. We are not paid by oligarchs. As an, uh, as an artist. Uh, as, an, um, um, as a man uh, thinking politically, why was the need uh, to write this huge book with a lot of uh, essayism in a positive sense, uh, with a lot of polemics to get on terms with the 20th century? What was the reason for you? I used to think that all events, as I already told, are connected. It's very hard for me to discuss nowadays, if not to come further and deeper in history. It's my third novel, now I'm writing the fourth one, and uh, hope to finish it in a year or so, uh, about European resistance in general, phenomenon of European resistance. and. Uh, always what I'm trying to do, both in my pictures and in my writings, I'm trying to combine um, private events of my biography, uh, or biography of my family, let me say personal history. I'm trying to put it together with, um, with uh, history in general to show my own, and our own, if to speak about family, our own lives as a part of big mosaic, as a part of big construction, and to find, not only to find the place of our lives in this huge picture, but even on the contrary, to, to, to underline that each life and each personal story is representing the whole history in general. Each life can be received as a microcosm of the huge history, of the big, big history. And to compare those two pictures, this microcosm and macrocosm, the personal biography and the huge picture of big events, is a kind of challenge uh, which is very interesting for me, both, again, both in uh, um, visual art and, and in literature. So, it's part of uh, answer. The other part of answer, I think, at least for me, I think nowadays literature and art 
um, needs some different approach. I do not understand just fiction now. I think what time requests is a kind of Cornelius Tatsit writings, just to rise up the whole material at once. If you wish to define certain detail, you have to rise the, the big, big, massive um, material of, of past. Isn't that a risky experiment? It is risky. Well, what is, what is not risky in our poor life? You uh, get responsible for a lot of things you might not be responsible for. Probably, I have no answer on this. Okay. Ich würde gern im Publikum fragen, wenn Sie Fragen an Maxim Kantor haben, gibt es im Moment welche? Ansonsten äh, frage ich Kantor äh, weiter. Um, and um, a central moment uh, in this story is the story of the, um, um, of the Second World War. Mm -hmm. um, why are you so interested? It's a very, it was a, uh, a very important um, um, Soviet um, um, matter, uh, a thousand times uh, described in a better or worse way, sometimes in a good way, shown in many films. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, the whole um, cinema industries up to now, it's even getting more and more. Uh, um, was it the point uh, to get on terms with the Second World War, which is obviously, uh, which has not happened uh, in, the, in Russia itself, because there is still a lot of discussion about the Second World War. There is on one hand uh, this enormous tragedy uh, with an enormous uh, um, quantity of, uh, of victims, uh, um, incredibly high in the Soviet Union, in Russia, uh, and you have this um, story which develops very in a very strange way after the collapse of the Soviet Union when uh, the, the Second World War comes somehow nearer and nearer every year. Mm -hmm. To give a, a, a strange example, nearby you have this monument of the Russian liberator of Vienna. Uh, I, don't, I, I suppose you have seen this monument. I live nearby uh, for many years, uh, so passing there every day and every April there was nothing in late Soviet times about the liberation day of Vienna, the 13th of April 45. Nothing. Uh, it started in 1995, obviously because of the 50th anniversary of this uh, date. And it gets more and more, uh, well, you, you, you will see more and more delegations, people there uh, at this either on the day of the liberation of Vienna or on the 9th of, of May, uh, uh, you have, um, it, it's a mirror of what's going on in Russia because at the very beginning they were all, the former Soviet states or most of them, they were together, the military attaches. Now you have this uh, bizarre war. I do not mean the war between Russia and Ukraine, but this war about a monument each year, uh, it is somehow grotesque. Uh, what about this story of the war, which has some real importance in the life of your family and in this book? Well, to start with, it's not only about Second World War, but it's about history of war in general, which is endless history. And I start, um, since it is a story of several generations of family, it starts with revolution and revolutionary wars, and with First World War, which was also very cruel, and through the Civil War to Second World War, or Great Patriotic War in Russia, and to uh, this uh, disgusting colonial war in Ukraine with which uh, story of book ends. 
So it's not about only Second World War, it's about the story of 20th century through the story of three generations of family. I do not say that it's only about Second World War, which, uh, sorry to say that, but it was just an episode, probably the mostly powerful and dramatic and bloody episode, but, but it is an episode in the story of 20th century. And if it all ends with colonial war of Russia against Ukraine, undeclared war, secret war, but at the same time very bloody, cynical and uh, criminal war. By the way, this war lasts already longer than uh, uh, Great Patriotic War, which for Russia was four years, and now we have more than four years with, of war with Ukraine. So, uh, yes, this, this book is also about history of wars. If it has something personal to do with uh, uh, my family, yes, indeed so, my parents, my uncles, my father participated in, in a war. My uncles were members of Interbrigade in Spain. My father was participant in the Second World War. And my grandfather was anarchist and he participated in the revolution of 1905 as anarchist. And his name is Moses, but his nickname and part of anarchists was Maxim. So, um, named in honor of my grandfather and in honor of anarcho-syndicalist group in Russia, so, <laughs> which is funny, but it's a, it's a feature of biography. Uh, so that's it. It's, uh, yes, I, 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 I'm interested in history of wars. At the time when this war in Ukraine uh, started, uh, or the occupation of, of Crimea, did you expect that this? Um, uh, you were already living somewhere in Western Europe. Uh, I, I live in Western Europe already for decades, since I'm working as artist in, uh, in Germany and in Britain and in France and so on. For several years, I'm a member of, uh, fellow of Pembroke College in Oxford. So I, used to live abroad for quite a while, but when war with Ukraine started, I simply quitted my, cancelled my, my presence in, uh, in Russia and decided to, to, to move just on constant basis. If I shared the time between Russia and Europe before that, like probably two-thirds in Europe and one-third in Russia, then after war started, I simply decided to, to quit the time in, in, in Russia. It was not immigration since I already felt myself part of Europe. I have several citizenship in Britain and Germany and Argentina and so but it, it happened due to, 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 many, to many reasons. And so I, I, I simply decide to stay in one of the cities which already was very familiar to me. That's My it. question was, if you were astonished about this war, did you expect this? Uh, yes, I, I, uh, uh, my, uh, sorry, my father sorry, told uh, me. I want to precise it. They, uh, there was uh, the, this uh, few days, two days war in, in, in Georgia before, uh, and there were a lot of, uh, uh, right after 91, uh, you got in 1991 uh, Abkhazia, uh, you got uh, this uh, Tajik uh, civil war, uh, so Pridisnyovre, uh, uh, Moldavia. Yeah, so uh, there is a, a permanent uh, a chain of, of unfortunate uh, 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 events. Uh, this permanent chain appears and goes on due to very simple reason: a Russian Empire started to get back its territories, like it always had happened after Russia had to sacrifice territories of empire, like it happened in 30s when after Brest agreement 
Russia lost Bessarabia, Baltic countries, Finland, etc., etc. Russia in the 30s, in late 30s, uh, Russia immediately started with war with Poland, as you know, trying to get Poland back. But, but then with uh, Molotov-Ribbentrop, they took back part, part of Poland and Ukraine, etc., etc. Then it was Baltic countries which were occupied, and it was attempt to occupy Finland. But again, it, w it happened only due to simple fact that Russian Empire felt it's necessary to get territories back and got good part of them. The same had happened now when Russia sacrificed territories of Ukraine, Belarus, Moldova, Bessarabia, um, Eastern, Asia. Eastern uh, European countries which were in Soviet bloc. Warsaw block. Uh, then it happened that Russia started to gather those lands again. It started with Chechnya, but it continued with Moldova and with, uh, um, and of course it was expected. My father told me, I do remember it now, he already 10 years passed off, uh, but he told me 10 years ago that it will be attack over Ukraine. I didn't believe him at that time. It will be what? Attack ag okay. against Ukraine, towards Ukraine. I, I didn't believe him at that time. I, I thought it's, it's not possible to, to, that I will not see the war between Ukraine and Russia. But he was correct. So the, the, the uh, approach to get Russian Empire back is very strong. And it, yes, it was expected. Um, a very minor detail. Uh, anyway, as um, it's uh, connected with a prominent name, uh, you know this story about the. Um, for some of you, it's a boring question already. You know this story about the the Brodsky poem, uh, uh, written in the very uh, anti-Ukrainian way, the uh, anti very imperialistic way, in, uh, because of the uh, um, um, independence of Ukraine. Yes, was this something? Um, this something astonishing, uh, uh, and I take Brodsky as a part of the Russian intelligentsia at that moment um, to be very imperialist, uh, which came um, a, a moment which was only clear at the, when this war started, uh, because many things were separated, even among your, uh, some of your friends, I suppose. Yes, that's right. Dear Erich, I think we, st we started this conversation with, uh, at least I started my, 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 my answering with a statement that dissident movement has its variety in it. And there are different types of being dissident and like different types of being avant-gardists, different ways to be avant-gardists. Brodsky is a wonderful poet, probably great poet. Some of his verses are fantastic. Uh, I think it's, well, it's my opinion. Uh, I do not ask anybody to share it, but since you ask myself, I answer myself. My opinion that his uh, uh, significance as a great poet is somehow exaggerated. He is not a wise man, and poet probably should not be that wise. Uh, his essays, in my opinion, are not very deep. And uh, he, he, he certainly is a great poet, and some of his verses are magnificent, but essays are very foolish. And uh, this uh, poem against Ukraine, in my opinion, sir, to pronounce it, is a very disgusting poem. And uh, I do not understand why we should make out of poet just out of poet, not of general, not of prime minister of country, not of um, great economist, um, not of party leader. Why should we make out of poet someone whose opinion about history is that significant? 
We do not do it out of Shakespeare even, although Shakespeare is, again, sorry for my opinion, is much more talented than Joseph Brodsky, uh, just by far much more talented. But even Shakespeare ended, Shakespeare ended with a very disgusting play, Henrik VIII. Henrik VIII, English king, who beheaded Thomas More. And uh, Shakespeare managed to write uh, this play without even putting Thomas More in, in this play. He simply somehow wrote the play without mentioning his name. And it was the author of King Lear. It was the author of Hamlet. Probably it's the false play which does not belong to, to him. But up now we do consider And, and it is not the mostly uh, adorable play I ever wrote. W why should I say this about Shakespeare and to count stupid verses by Brodsky as a great example of, an, in, in, uh, uh, of poetry? Sorry, I do not. I was asking about Brodsky because obviously, probably, Tyrol is the second uh, example, but only in Russia people say... Uh, in Russia, a poet is more than a poet. I and never said it. Someone I know that you uh, did hmm. not say this, uh, but uh, you know this. It's Yevtushenko uh, who said it. I know. Who, I know, who, who, I know. Was, who was only a poet, <laughs> yeah. by the way. And uh, not more than that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but anyway, for example, we got the 100th birthday of uh, another of these uh, dinosauric figures of Solzhenitsyn, I mean. Mm -hmm. You remember this joke? who was Brezhnev, a minor dictator in the epoch of Sakharov and Solzhenitsyn. That's right. So, um, you know the, you see the relations uh, sometimes in Russia, some Russians can put it the other way around uh, and this is something one can appreciate very much, I think. I even um, would say Maxim Kantor is a figure more than a painter or a writer? Of course, firstly I'm father of children <laughs> and I, I believe it's much more significant. To be writer and painter is just a hobby. Ah. Very much, uh, thank you very much, Maxim Kantor. Vielen Dank für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit. Uh, es hat sich niemand mehr mit einer Frage gemeldet. Ist keine Frage mehr eingefallen, dann danke ich Ihnen für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit, für dieses ein wenig dahin mehrandernde Gespräch. Schönen Dank.